four years ago, in the final year of the Trump administration, right before the pandemic, it would be kind of a boring conversation, <laughs> other than sort of looking in the rearview mirror and saying, well, yeah, we had that problem, but we solved it. We had that problem, we solved it. No wars. I made a short list. Russia, Ukraine, Israel, Hamas, Iran, Yemen and the Houthis, Afghanistan, China, China, and more China, North Korea, incursions into Taiwan from China, Mexico, Venezuela, pressure on El Salvador when they're doing the right thing, that is all happening right now during uh, the Biden administration. You missed one big one, the Balkans. Yeah. Oh, and the Balkans, of course. So where to begin? Actually, I'd like to begin with NATO. Because there's a lot of fake news out there right now about Trump throwing NATO under the bus and Trump tearing up Article 5 and Trump allowing Putin to roll tanks in and throwing our NATO allies. Last I checked, under President Trump, he tripled the amount of spending for the European Defense Initiative. He increased the troops by nearly 6% on behalf of NATO. And actually, the leader of NATO at the time said that Trump had made NATO stronger. The outgoing Prime Minister of the Netherlands, who is poised to now take over NATO, just said that Europe should stop whining about Donald Trump. What do they know that Joe Biden doesn't know? Well, so first of all, I, I believe that nothing undermines NATO like not paying your bills, right? <laughs> so if you believe in NATO, you should be paying your 2%. Now, this gets a little dense, but in 2014, NATO members came together in Wales at the Wales meeting, and they said, we need to pay 2% of our GDP. But it's so expensive to do this that we're going to give ourselves 10 years to do it. So in 2014, they made a commitment that in 10 years, we will ramp up and get to the 2%. Now, Chancellor Merkel told me and President Trump that she couldn't get there until 2031. And we said, well, you actually signed the agreement in 2014. Not your former government, it was you. And so we gave you 10 years. We thought you should have paid in 2014, but we gave you 10 years. And, and I think that the pressure campaign clearly worked. President Trump, you know, clearly uh, made it an issue, a top issue. The Biden team and their ambassadors, they don't bring it up. You can look on the websites of the embassies and they don't bring up the 2%. So that pressure has completely been taken back. I have one other point about, uh, NATO elections. So we're supposed to have uh, NATO elections soon. They're scrambling to pick the new Secretary General of NATO. We have European elections in June, and we have the American election in November. Technically, the current Secretary General of NATO's term goes through October. We do not need to pick someone in April or May or June. We need to pick someone after the U.S. elections. It's delaying it 30 days. Mm. They should absolutely pick someone who comes from a country who's already spent 2%. And I believe that no NATO member should be allowed to vote on the next Secretary General or the expansion of NATO if you're not paying your 2%. Why are we asking members who are not paying their fair share to pick new members to come in and extend the security umbrella so that you all have to pay the bills for people. We had NATO members just joining within the last year who came in and weren't even paying 2%. Yeah. What club do you know that you get to go and not pay your dues and immediately belly up to the bar? Right, now, 100%. And, but you know your friends in the mainstream media say, well, it's not really dues, the 2% is 2% of GDP, and of course All the more reason, knows. all the more yes. reason that they should be paying, because it is 2%. The, the, it's 2% of your GDP right. spent on your own defense. Right? It could be a jobs program. And, the, and this is the key, though, isn't it? Because when you're spending other people's money, it's very easy to make decisions and commit someone else's military to a cause that you're not actually paying for. As soon as they have skin in the game, suddenly you start making decisions in a more circumspect way, I would Yeah, think. so the way that this, this, this uh, translates is NATO has a list of things in case there's a war, right? It's kind of like... A, a wedding registry. Yeah. 
you sign up to bring something to the wedding. <laughs> and for NATO, you sign up and say, hey, we can do this collectively. We have this capability. We can do that. You sign up. If you don't have the capability in your own country to do these things, then you are not being a good member of NATO. And by the way, one last point on yeah. this thing. There, all the German media are going crazy by saying, well, the Germans suddenly this year have decided to meet the 2%. Shame on the media and shame on NATO for allowing the Germans to count a whole bunch of things in there that are not about their defense. Climate change spending is not defense. Yeah. Making buildings yeah. and infrastructure should not be part of your defense when you're, when you're behind and you're not paying your 2%. I would say to my friends in the German media, you should check those numbers and you should ask yourself, why did Chancellor Merkel say it would take her till 2031, but suddenly the uh, socialists and Schultz say, oh, lo and behold, we did it this year. I just like talking to somebody who knows that Helmut Kohl is no longer the Chancellor of Germany, so that was <laughs> impressive there. Um, let's keep talking about Germany, but but make the perspective about Russia. Because when you were ambassador to Germany and you were carrying out Trump policies there, a big effort was to wean Germany and all of Western Europe off of Russian oil, off of Russian gas, off of being dependent on them. And I remember you and the president making the case that if you wean yourself off of their energy supplies, then you won't be funding their war efforts. Yeah. And then what happened when Joe Biden became president? So I don't expect the European media to apologize to Donald Trump, but they should. Because Donald Trump was right about Nord Stream 2 when we had it sanctioned, the Russian pipeline, Putin's pipeline. Donald Trump was right about the 2% spending. And Donald Trump was right about Iran sanctions. The Biden administration was on the wrong side of all three of those. Chancellor Merkel lobbied against all three of those. So let's just take the Russian pipeline. As part of our US policy under the Trump administration, we thought Nord Stream 1 would be appropriate. It's part of the diversification of energy and Nord Stream 1 was appropriate. We said Nord Stream 2 went too far. You were, you were allowing Russia to have too much influence over the energy of Europe. So we said no, we sanctioned that pipeline. It never became operable under the Trump administration. Chancellor Merkel was never happy about that. She wanted the sanctions dropped. And she said things to me like, well, you don't understand uh, Germany's relationship with Russia. We can control them. We have you know, ways to, to uh, block that. They're never going to leverage us like that. She was wrong. The Germans were wrong. The German government was wrong on that. And for her to lobby Joe Biden and the Senate Democrats, I challenge people to go look at the Senate statements from Democratic senators when they voted to drop the Trump sanctions on the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. This was early in the Trump administration. They said in many of these speeches that it was not appropriate to sanction Russia and stick them in the eye on this pipeline. That was a strategic blunder. I actually believe that when we showed weakness to Putin and we dropped the sanctions, the US government, I should say, the Democrats, dropped the sanctions on the Nord Stream 2 pipeline and allowed that pipeline to come online, mm. Putin saw that as incredible weakness and his signal to begin to go in and start a war. Let's also remember that Vladimir Putin has said, we should say this every day, and everybody should say this loudly, Vladimir Putin has endorsed Joe Biden for president. Vladimir Putin said, I want Biden because he's predictable. Yeah. He, and the predictability is he's going to drop the sanctions on my pipeline. And that's exactly what happened. It is. Although I'm, I'm told the Biden administration is going to roll out a new package of sanctions tomorrow. I don't know if you saw this news item. Three today. and a half years late. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, let's talk about Putin and specifically with regard to Ukraine. What is the way forward? President Trump has said you elect him. He solves it in a week. I'm guessing you might be one of the people at the table figuring out what happens <laughs> during that week. What's going to happen? What should happen? Look. 
there, uh, let me back up for a second and just, just say there's a difference between a threat of military action and a credible threat of military action. And I think Putin was getting at this predictability issue with Biden through that phrase. If you have a credible threat of military action, it really means we don't quite know what's going to happen with you. Mm. You're not predictable. You might just do something you know, that we don't expect. And so when you look at this war in Ukraine, uh, I, I actually, of course, we know Putin is a terrible person. He is... Um, a human rights abuser. We know all of this. No one that I know defends Putin in any way. But I believe that the President of the United States in the Oval Office, when making big decisions like hundreds of billions of dollars of American taxpayer money going to a foreign country, when you're making those decisions, you need to have two strong voices in front of you, in front of you at, while you're sitting in the Oval Office. The president needs a secretary of defense who does not negotiate and who is fully prepared to do whatever is needed. But the president of the United States also needs a top diplomat, a secretary of state, that will absolutely say, not yet. We're not doing this yet. We still have diplomatic things to do. We have to have tough diplomats. If you want to avoid war, you need tough diplomats. And I'm, t I'm sorry to tell you, but through the entire Trump administration, the Democrats made fun of tough diplomacy. They, every one of our ambassadors, every time President Trump used tough diplomacy, the Democrats mocked it. They said, oh, you can't be mean to our allies like that. Mm -hmm. You're so mean. I have to say to you, you better have an SOB diplomat if you want to avoid war. All right. Let's move to the Middle East, if you don't mind. Um, during the Trump administration, uh, humanitarian funding, so-called humanitarian funding, to Hamas in the Gaza territory was cut off because President Trump and his SOB diplomats said that that money was not humanitarian. It was going to build the terror war machine that Hamas was set to build. Biden gets into office. He reopens the funding to Hamas. Three years later, we have October 7th. Is it too easy to connect those dots? Because, I mean, I'm not a national security or foreign policy expert, but it sure seems like we funded, in part, those attacks. Well, first of all, I don't think that we can have this conversation without saying Iran. Okay. Iran is responsible. Iran and their proxies are responsible. Well, we funded them, too. So. We funded them. And, and, you know, the reality is, is that Donald Trump rallied the world, again, at the complaints of Democrats who wanted to do the JCPOA 3.0 or 4.0, whatever it is now, we, we literally rejected all of that, you know, can't you just be nice to the Iranian regime talk from the other side? Yeah, come on, great Satan, be nicer to them. International types really wanted us to engage and try engagement. Now, look, I, I think engagement sometimes works, and certainly Donald Trump showed us that engagement with North Korea worked. But sometimes engagement doesn't work, and you have to do sanctions. There's a whole bunch of tools that we can do to avoid war, sanctions, isolation, engagement. We've got to be able to benchmark these things and ask ourselves after three months, are these things working? We realized Donald Trump's policy on Iran was working. We had rallied the world to not do business with them. We sanctioned them. They were squeezed. And when the Biden team came in, they relieved that pressure. They relieved the sanctions. So it's over $100 billion in sanctions relief, credit, and cash that we've given the Iranian regime. You cannot be surprised that the Iranian regime then turns around, money is fungible, and starts spending money on terrorism. Hezbollah got money from them. Hamas got money from them. All of the bad actors. Houthis. The Houthis. Yeah. And, and so you, we should not be surprised that this war on October 7th was absolutely funded by Iran and the money that Joe Biden sent them. I'm sorry, those are tough words, but that is the fact. Yeah. Um, yes. the, uh, the Knesset in Israel, there are 99 seats this week. Imagine this, imagine a legislative body in America 
The vote out of 99 seats was 90 to 9 in the Knesset this week against authorizing discussions for a Palestinian state. Yeah. And yet, the Biden administration's stated policy is to still force a so-called two-state solution on our most important ally in the Middle East, Israel, the only functioning, only functioning government in the Middle East, uh, representative government, I should say. Why on earth would our policy be so directly against the people of that nation? Michigan. <laughs> Dearborn in particular. Uh, look, look, the, the reality is we, um, we, we've had a real tough time watching the Biden team go back and forth on all of this craziness. They don't know what their policy is. They have undermined, just like the border policy, actually. They've tried some things. You know, you, you've seen them now come back and say, oh, well, maybe Biden is going to do some executive orders when I thought that executive orders didn't work and they needed a piece of legislation. We see the same thing now with the Israel-Palestinian issue. Um, we have to be really honest about the fact that there are still hostages. We, American hostages. And we have American hostages. As well as Israel. And Joe Biden has not spent the time to free Americans held hostage by Hamas. When you ask for a ceasefire, well, we still have hostages, you're asking to reward Hamas. I don't believe that we should have a conversation about two states, what happens in Gaza next, all of that, until you free our hostages. We have hostages that were taken by a terrorist organization. You want to have a conversation? Free our hostages, and then we will talk. But we're not going to reward you with talk of a second state or what happens to Gaza or any of that. And, and let me also say this. The Biden administration needs to be much tougher on Qatar. Hmm. Because Qatar, Qatar can be our ally. And I'm not somebody who just wants to beat up on Qatar. I know that they have... Uh, a difficult region, we'll say it that way. And I want to work with them. And I think it's really important that we work with them. We have not pressured them enough, and we have not pressured the region enough to get our hostages back. The, uh, the Middle East had reached such a uh, unprecedented point at the end of the Trump administration with the Abraham Accords, uh, multiple Arab nations making peace agreements with Israel. Some people had never thought it possible. Even Jake Sullivan bragged a month before the October 7th attacks how relatively calm Middle East was. Um, and I asked somebody in the Trump uh, administration once, you know, after the presidency, how did the Abraham Accords happen? How, how was that even possible? And it's very simply said, you move the embassy to Jerusalem, you stop acting like, oh, you know, both sides in the Israel-Palestine conflict have, you know, valid arguments. No. Our ally is Israel. We stand with Israel. You want to be America's friend, then you better make friends with Israel. Is it really that simple? Because it, it kind of makes sense. And I know they're telling us to wrap, so I'll be quick here. Um, oh. Look, I, I think that the reality is, is the success that Donald Trump had is because he really avoided politics and concentrated on job creation and the economy. And he did that in, in the Balkans, where I know for sure that that's the, the plan that worked. And, and, you know, between President Trump and Jared Kushner and Mike Pompeo and others, they really did concentrate on how do you just bring sides together to talk about growing economies and jobs. Young people re leave the region because they don't have hope and they don't have a job. So part of our foreign policy, if we want to solve problems, is to avoid the political talk and figure out ways to do greater trade. That's going to make us more safe. I think our embassies need to be mini trade uh, offices. Mm. We need to be pushing American jobs. That's what we need to be doing around the world because when somebody has a job and, and hope and they can provide for their family, we're going to have a lot less fighting. Uh, i, I got to hit Latin America. I know we're going to wrap, but Latin America, especially since President Bukele is coming out in a moment. Uh, right? <laughs> this administration barely talks about our closest neighbors. 
Uh, they absolutely upended the deals that had been made with Mexico for Remain in Mexico. Obviously, the border crisis is an absolute disaster of their making and, I think, of their design. Meanwhile, we've got a man like President Bukele who comes in. You talk about root causes of the... He actually has begun fixing the root causes in El Salvador. He's put the murderers in jail. Salvadorans are actually going back home because they want to be home. Yeah. And this administration actually chastises him. Yeah. This administration actually is suspicious of something that's actually working. Yeah. I'll be very quick here. The, look, our Latin American policy has been terrible over the last couple of years. Uh, we have a State Department that's playing politics, that's pushing left-wing ideas down in Central and South America. Uh, President Bukele will be able to talk about this. He's been so brave. He's been so courageous and very creative. And he's a, he's a leader that I think we need to model throughout that whole region. I'll leave it at that. Um, if I may, quickly, you know, we, we all, I think, know who we're voting for come November. Um, I think that we're, we're mis, there it is. I think that we're fooling ourselves if we don't realize that there are still people who have not made up their mind. There are still people who would rather have two different choices. That's fine. They, they're going to go their way. I can tell you for people in my life who are on the fence or not sure who to vote for, I say, you know what? You've got a problem with Biden or Trump. Stop for a moment. Because it's not just about the man who sits in the Oval Office. You're electing a team. You're electing a foreign policy and national security team. And look at who we've got running our foreign policy right now. And look at the great people who could be part of this next administration. Like Rick Renner. Thanks, Larry.